Uh, are we going to have that, that uh, number up there again, guys? Can we put that number up there again for people that want to give us additional uh, questions tonight? And uh, we've got several. We're going to try and probably weave these questions that you asked into the presentation tonight. It's like you're reading our minds what we're going to be doing. And so thank you for those. And please feel free uh, to call that number right there and uh, send us a text. And we would love to, love to put those on the list, if not for tonight, uh, certainly for uh, next time. So without further ado, Jonathan, take it away. Thank you so much, Pastor, for having me back. Trusting me once again. I take that as a privilege. Um, just to kind of set the tone, a lot of questions that did come in have to do with some specifics. And so um, I wanted to show this brief little video. It's the one that we show at Focus on the Family every once in a while. Brandon, if you've got that queued up, many of you probably seen this one before too. For sure, you know. And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me. And... I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head, and it's relentless, and I don't know if it's going to stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most, is that I don't know if it's ever going to stop. Yeah. <laughs> you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing. You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail see, out. See, you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just, sometimes it's like there's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. <laughs> that, that sounds really hard. It's... <laughs> Ow! Oh, come on. Ow. If you would just... Don't! Try to see things my way. <laughs> all right. <laughs> So we're talking about some heavy stuff, and I, I just thought it would be helpful to laugh a little bit. But how many know that's the human condition, right? Um, one of the first things we try to establish right away is the issue is not the issue. And um, I just want to remind you of that. The issue isn't the issue. So last week we talked about how to build a life, and um, outside of faith in Christ, I'm just not sure if I can answer that question. So as a Christian therapist, as a minister, I just want to put that out there first and foremost, that if your life is built on the rock of Jesus Christ, you have a chance. <laughs> Other than that, you, you don't have a chance. So I just, um, I'm, I'm serious. I, I, it kind of sounds a little funny, but you just don't, you just don't give yourself the best chance. So I just want to cover a few things that we talked about last week in some detail. And I came prepared with my bears. We're going to get to that a little bit later. Um, but there's a slide that I referred to last week called the anatomy of a wound. And if you could just show that. Um, I'll just break that down for you. Some of you asked about that. The anatomy of a wound. So um, we go through life and we just carry with us some disappointments some uh, failures, some of the disappointments we've caused, some of them have been perpetrated upon us. Um, again, it's a detail, and it's almost like if we spend time talking about who did what, who was wrong, who was right, you kind of just get stuck. But wounds happen to us, and um, just like a wound that may happen in your body physically, sometimes emotionally a wound does occur. And so if we can draw some insight from how the body responds to a wound, this can give us some information on how to move forward with an emotional wound. So just like your body, if, it, if, I, if someone came up to you and whacked you really hard on the leg, the first thing that would happen is your body would send some, uh, a pain signal to you that you've been hit. And if it was a laceration, then the blood would start to coagulate, right, start to stop the bleeding as much as it can, then it would probably require some help. 
And, um, but the body knows I got to pay attention to that right away. The difference is that emotionally, our heart says you got to pay attention to this thing right away, but our mind talks us out of that. And we'll say things like, it's not that bad, or, you know, again, I referred to the comment last week, you know, we judge people by their actions, but we want to be judged by our intentions. So we may cause the wound, we may have the wound, and we're just kind of looking at the wrong things. So uh, we don't allow ourselves a chance to feel that pain, and that, inf that pain is information that can help us move forward. So we have a wound. If left unattended, it just grows and grows and grows. And, and we don't know why we fly off the handle so quickly. We don't know why we feel so depressed. We don't know why um, we just can't find happiness. That was one of the trick words that we had last week. Why am I never happy? Why is it so hard for me to smile? You know, there's just wound that just keeps growing and growing. And the devil is opportunistic. So he sees the wound and he says, perfect. The next thing for me to do is slide a little lie to wrap around the wound. <clears throat> and without getting too specific, but yet giving you something to hold on to, that, that lie could be, no one will ever love me. I'll never be treated properly. I'll never be happy. Um, I'll never, or uh, it will never happen for me. So I'll just never get over that corner. I'll just never, I'll just never, whatever that lie is, we just kind of believe it because we're wounded and we're vulnerable. As we d develop this belief around the lie, the next thing you know, the next layer around that is a fear. So we never trust anybody. We never put ourselves out there. We have a hard time walking in faith because we just, there are just so many things we don't know. I don't know if I can go forward. And we just start operating around a fear. Now, don't get hung up on the word fear because fear could be a worry, a concern, anxiety around something. You just unsure. You know, you're operating from this level of being unsure. But Scripture is pretty clear, as you see listed there at the bottom of the screen, the antidote for all those steps, all those pieces of anatomy of a wound. So if we start from the outside and work our way in, uh, Scripture is pretty clear that the antidote to fear is love. Perfect love casts out fear. There's no judgment there, is what the Scripture says in 1 John. And if we believe this lie, the enemy's been feeding us this lie, and we believe it, sometimes we create the lie ourselves. The antidote to the lie is truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought of the truth in that way, but that would be awesome if we started applying the truth of God's Word to these areas of our emotional self that have been wounded. Amen. Wow, how different would our Christian walk be if we actually believed what he said is true about us and formed our identity around that truth. And then, of course, the wound. The scripture is pretty clear that we judge the outside, but God knows the heart. He can see the inside. He's knit me together in my mother's womb. Even before I was created, he knew me. He knows the number of hair on my head. There is a level of information that God holds about me and about you that just cannot be compared. And if he holds that information, therefore he knows how to heal you. And, and there's so many scriptures that you could probably go to that just to demonstrate the healing power of the Lord. But I just pulled this one from Psalms. From the psalmist David, Lord my God, I called to you for help, and you healed me. David is actually quite a good example of that kind of tension between the pain and, and the healing. And as he walked through that, I read a little bit from Psalm 139 um, last week, and that's a great example. You know, some of that psalm, he kind of flips gears and says, Lord, take, take him out. <laughs> kind of loses it for a second there. And then he says, you know what, create in me a, a clean heart. Just kind of do the work. I recognize that sometimes I can just go off the rails here. Yeah. So come and do what only you can do. So there you have it. That's an anatomy of a wound. Um, the next slide, please. <clears throat> okay. 
Um, this is labeled husbands and wives, but I just want you to know this applies to friends. This applies to any kind of relationship. God designed us to be in community, and so therefore this could be you and the person beside you, um, your child and an adult, uh, a parent, two friends. I'm going to ask Pastor Gary to step out of his comfort zone here. Although we had a brief talk about it. <laughs> so um, this represents my heart, okay? And that's Pastor Gary's heart. And uh, a lot of what we do in relationships, because we're driven by fear, fear is one of the primary motivators of of our behavior um, is we enter into a relationship with somebody and we do this. Now, again, this is my heart, right? Um, I, you know, I, I, I have a relationship with Pastor Gary, so here you go. Um, wait, no, don't, you're kind of squeezing me. I can't breathe there. Can you? Yes. Yeah, wait, wait, no. That, now you're dangling. Now I'm back in. Oh, wait, okay, wait a second. That's too close, too tight. The light's in my eyes. <laughs> Aside from all the laughter, how many get that? Um, there's a song that we sing. I don't know, if Josh, if you've sang it, I give myself away. That's not exactly, I give myself to the Lord. He's safe. But I can't give myself away. You're, he's ready. I thought I was getting that hard. Yeah. <laughs> I can't give myself away and expect the other person to take care of what God has asked me to take care of. So I just want to lay out some principles that kind of describe this fear cycle, okay? <clears throat> Psalm 423 says, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Guard your heart. What exactly does that mean? Um, I'm responsible, therefore, for my thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and beliefs. I'm responsible for that. Scripture commands us to be personal, responsible for our actions, no matter what the other person is doing. In Luke chapter 6, verse 27 and 29, it records Jesus' words, I tell you who hear me, love your enemies, and do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other also. And Christ modeled this behavior. When he prays that God would forgive those who are torturing him, Christ was not controlled by others' behaviors or external circumstances. Instead, he chose compassion in the face of being assaulted and chose to keep his heart open rather than become closed and reactive. I want you to just take a look one more time in your mind's eye. If you're not familiar with this passage, I don't have the reference in front of me, but Jesus in Gethsemane. And, and if you look at that from this perspective, he is crying drops of blood. It is so intense. The emotional experience is so intense. Now, you and I, maybe we wouldn't, but I, I would think we probably would say, Lord, let this cup pass. In fact, if you're not going to do it, I'm just going to do it. Because I'm God and I can take care of it. But the fact is he allowed himself to experience pain, an emotional pain that was so intense. And he just said in that wisdom about being personally responsible, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. You cannot do that if your life isn't built on the foundation of Christ as your Savior. And he can't do that if he didn't have that connection with his heavenly Father. Principle number one, be responsible for your own thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Principle number two, I'm responsible, excuse me, I am not responsible for my wife's thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. You are not responsible for your friend's thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. I just want you to let that sink in for a sec. If I'm responsible for my thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, therefore I'm not responsible for my partner's thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. In the beginning of our marriage, I tried desperately to get through. When we were in a conflict, I tried desperately to get through to Dusty, and she would give me the silent treatment. Anyone know what that is? 
It's tough. And tried as I might, I just could not get through. I can't force Dusty to feel, think, believe anything that God hasn't wired her to think, feel, believe, or behave. The sooner you recognize that, the better off your life will be. So if I'm responsible for me, I'm therefore not responsible for her or for Pastor Gary in this case. Principle number three, in a relationship, we impact one another's thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. We don't determine them. I'm responsible for mine. I'm not responsible for hers, but I can influence. I don't have the power to control, but I do have the power to influence. I have the power to influence. So if I walk home and she's in a great mood, but I walk home and I slam the door shut from the garage and I stomp around, and you can tell on my face, which you, she can definitely tell on my face, something is not right. I may not be asking her to feel a certain way, but I am definitely impacting her day at that moment. But whose decision is it to feel, think, or behave in a certain way? It'd be Dusty's. I may be grumpy bear, but if she's not, she has the power to make that decision. Okay? So some of you have asked, what do you do if the other person is not reacting in a way that is safe or appropriate? And so this diagram right here kind of shows uh, it could be anybody that you're in a relationship with. I have a fear, I therefore react. The person sees my reaction, it taps on a fear, they react. Their reaction taps on my fear, and I react again. And away we go in this thing called a fear cycle. So I have a fear of being not good enough. I don't know, last week if you caught that, I said I kind of feel nervous. That was a little fear speaking up, right? So I have this fear of not being good enough, and when I don't have a good sense of my relationship with Christ, and I'm not filled with his spirit, with his power, with his presence, I'm more susceptible to te people tapping that button called not, not good enough. So if it's low, and I do something, and um, this hasn't happened, so this is just a make-believe, right? Let's say some of you have seen me play piano, and if I'm low on my <clears throat> relationship with Christ, and I do something and I make a mistake, I will beat myself up. And if no one says anything like, hey, that was good, Jonathan, it's even worse. And so I then react by shutting down, or I'll get really critical towards myself, or I'll get really critical towards my family. And boom, I get critical towards my family. That pushes Dusty's button. It had nothing to do with her, but I'm in relationship with her. So if I get critical, she feels like maybe she's not good enough. I'm forgetting, we've done this chart a few times, and I'm forgetting which button. Like she's feeling maybe controlled, which is a big button for, for Dusty. Don't try to tell me what to do or how to think or what to say. Yeah. <clears throat> and so if she feels like her button of control has been hit, she's going to, one of her go-to things is what? Cross-complain. Or you think I'm, well, you are, and, you know, and then that hits my disrespect button. I've got at least five, if not 25. And so do you, by the way. I'm not the only one in that. And then so I feel disrespected. If I feel disrespected, I'm going to criticize. And if I criticize, she's going to feel disrespected too. And then she's going to shut down. And if she starts shutting down and withdrawing, man, I feel even more disrespected, and she's going to. Does this all sound familiar? Okay. I may not be using the words that you guys use in your friendships or in your marriages, but I think they're pretty universal experiences, right? If I come to church and I'm not feeling really, and Pastor Gary doesn't say hi to me, whoa, there's an email that's going to fly his way. So what do you do? I think that was one of the big things that we were, we were kind of talking about. What do you do? So back to the bear. If we could go to the next slide. 
this is called self-care. Sometimes it's known down um, at Focus on the Family as the care cycle. It's a care cycle because you start with the first A. There's five A's. And by the time you get to the fifth one, you may check back in with yourself and start over again. Okay, so when you think of moments where your button has been tripped, has been smashed, has been hit, there was a, before we go through this, I want to just set kind of a scenario for you that I think you can relate to. I was on Highway 60, James River Expressway. Just a few months ago, they were widening that highway. You remember this? Kind of like from Home Depot all the way to Cox South. And there were traffic cones, and it was just about that time where they were ready to move the cones. And I'm driving. Everybody's slowing down because it's a construction zone, and there's guys on the side of the road, and I'm doing my best to drive not only the speed of traffic, but not go over the speed limit. But there's somebody behind me, like, riding my tail. Has this ever happened to you? Now, a little backstory to that. I feel like I'm a good driver. I don't have road rage. But every once in a while, it kind of feels nice to stick it to that other driver, right? <laughs> I'm not one of those guys, but every once in a while, it's kind of nice to just stick it to them. So maybe that's the Northeast talking but <clears throat> so I'm, I'm in the lane. I got to get off at uh, South National, and this guy's just riding my tail. And I'm doing my best to stay calm. I'm listening to a leadership podcast. So I'm trying to take my mind, <laughs> trying to take my mind off of it. But the more he's doing this, actually, as a woman, doesn't really matter. It was a. Uh, <laughs> It was a woman driver, and a, in this story, it matters, okay? I'm just, you'll see why, yeah. I may be pushing some of your buttons, and I apologize. It was a woman driver and a male passenger, and the male passenger is the one who's being really confrontational. He's using his hands to make all kinds of wonderful gestures to me, and I just kept pointing, like, as if he could understand me, but I just kept pointing to the construction, like, what do you want me to do? You know, it's construction. So finally, I can get over, and he comes around me, she comes around me, and they just kind of stay in my blind spot for a little bit. And I can feel my hands grip the steering wheel just a little tighter. Do you know what I mean? And my accelerator foot is just getting ready, because if we're going to go, I want to be ready to go. I was not prepared for what was going to happen next. So he comes beside me, or she drives right beside me, and it dawns on me why they hung back there in my blind spot. He needed just like five, six extra seconds to drop his drawers and put his bare butt <laughs> up against the window. <clears throat> I'm not responsible for their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, <laughs> but I am responsible for my thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. So I see this ugly sight, <laughs> and I just thank God that South National was coming up, and I, I got off, but I could just tell. So my heart rate was starting to go up. Step number one, aware. Your body is already giving you messages from your heart that are telling you something is up. So for me, heart rate, my face gets red. And in that particular situation, I was gripping the steering wheel that much harder. I mean, it's 10 and 2, but it was like this. So, and my foot was ready to go. Ooh, I'm so I'm like, okay, Jonathan, don't. That's not nothing to do with you. He doesn't know you. But I could tell something was going on with me. Heart rate was up. Body alarms going. My reactions were ready to go. I'm aware that something is going on. So fill in the blanks there. How does your body tell you that you are feeling something 
that's not right. Something is off. And then how many times do you shut that signal off? Some people um, get tension in their neck. Some people get sweaty palms. Some people, their ears start to burn, whatever it is. Rumbly tummy, it doesn't matter. Your body is telling you something. Pay attention. It's information. Some people start speaking really fast. Some people lose their filter and start swearing. I'm just telling you, this is, these are the things that start happening. And you recognize that, that will help you move forward, okay? So step number one, be aware. Step number two, accept my heart, my job. I'm responsible for my thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. This is my heart. This is my job. Feelings give us information that something is going on. Step number three, pray. Now, I'm on the highway, and I can't stop and pray, but you better believe I was praying. Lord, I don't want to respond the way this person is responding, because that is not me. <laughs> That'd be kind of a miracle, too, if I get... I don't even... Yeah. I haven't been flexible for a long time. <clears throat> but, I, but I can certainly pray and say, Lord... This is um, something, I, I can feel it. I know that something's going on. And you know what? I'm actually five minutes away from my office where I'm supposed to be a therapist for people. I don't want to go into that setting charged up, so help me. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm telling you, it works. You could pray at step one, but my fear is that you would short-circuit the information. My fear is that you would stop and just go pray all the time and not recognize that you're actually feeling something. I, what I'm advising and what I'm encouraging you to do is to use how, you're, how God has created you to work together with what he wants for you. So, pray. Step three is to pray. Step number four, next slide. Okay, now I'm going to spend a bit more time and think about this. Um, okay, is this feeling familiar? I'm feeling pretty disrespected by that driver, to say the least. I'm feeling kind of enraged, too. Like, how unfair, how unjust. Is that a familiar feeling? Absolutely. Have I felt like things have been unfair before in my life? Yes, I have. So it's a feeling I can recognize. It's a feeling that is familiar. I've got those two first questions. I can attend to that. So whatever your situation is, you've paid attention. You're accepting that it's your job. You've, allowed, you've asked God to come alongside you and help you in this moment. Next question is, have I felt this before? Can I name the feeling? And I, have I felt this before? So my situation, I can name the feeling and I've felt it before. Next question would be, am I making it worse? So I told you I was listening to a leadership podcast. I actually turned the leadership podcast off because in that moment, I didn't want to hear how that particular leader was so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest with you, and to be honest with you, some of you may know this, but I've led worship for years and years. I didn't want to listen to worship music. I just wasn't ready. For me, it would, just, it would have made it worse. So I just turned the music off. I turned the podcast off, and it was just quiet. Me and my Lord, and we're talking. You may do it differently. I'm just telling you how I did it, okay? But there are ways I could have made it totally worse. I could have grabbed a steering wheel made a left swerve, follow them as far as, who knows, Republic, Willard. I, I mean, I just could have kept going. I could have pulled on my phone, taken a picture. Someone actually told me I should have done that. You should have taken a picture. I'm, really, I'm not interested in taking a picture. <laughs> <clears throat> you 
He could have called that in. I, I probably could have, but that would have made it worse for me. So think about this. There are moments in your life where you have felt a button has been pushed. You're kind of ignoring it, and you're making it worse. How do you make it worse? I wish it could be a little bit more interactive, but let me just fill in the blanks for you here. If you're, How do parents make it worse? Have you ever caught yourself lecturing your kids, and now it's going on 10 minutes of lecture, 20 minutes of lecture? You're making it worse. You're making it worse. I'm just, that's my opinion. Have I done it? Yes. I've, done, I've made it worse. In our relationship, I've made it worse. I didn't look at the signals that she was giving me, and I pursued, and she retreated, and I pursued, and she retreated, and I made it worse. So there are times we make, I could have gone to a heavy metal station and just felt the rage of the music, and it would have been a perfect match for the rage I was feeling, and let's go. That would have made it worse. And my luck, I would have hit the next exit at Campbell, and there would have been a police officer there with his radar gun. So am I contributing to this thing? Am I actually, so someone's hit my button, am I now standing on the button and making it worse? Am, am I just kind of like beating myself and making this thing worse? Be honest with yourself. You'll never go anywhere different if you are in denial of where you currently are. So be honest with yourself and recognize that you could be making it worse. So I did not want to do that. I'm telling you guys it's difficult, but it's so worth it. So truth versus truth. You guys notice the difference? Big T, little T. Little T, truth. Uh, that guy was rude. Absolutely. Little T, truth. Um, was he in a rush to go somewhere? Probably true. Little T, truth. Did I deserve that? No. Little T, truth. I didn't deserve that. Um, was there a construction zone that required I drive at a certain limit? Absolutely. Little T, truth. What is a big T, truth? Think of big T truth is at the end of the day, truth, blank. What? At the end of the day, truth, he doesn't know me. I don't know him. I need to pray for them. He's not my enemy. There's one enemy. And sometimes we lose sight of that. He's not my enemy. So I pray. That's big T truth. Second big T truth, God's opinion of me hasn't changed. God's opinion of that man has not changed changed. His heart towards him has not changed. Scripture is pretty clear. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. So, big T truth, little t truth. Do you get how that goes? You just kind of have this discussion with yourself. Okay, I'm not in denial of what just happened. That is lower T truth. But at the end of the day, truth, did it stop me from getting to my appointment on time? No, I could have. But no, I chose to get off, so that's a big T truth. Does my family love me? Does my I mean, you could just keep going down the list, okay? And I've talked to the Lord about this, and I'm just talking to myself now about this, and I'm ready to move on to the last step. The last step is act. How do I act now in a way that shows integrity? Now, when you think of the word integrity, most people think of the definition, what you do when no one is looking. But think of integrity this way. Everybody's familiar with Table Rock Lake, right? Table Rock Lake has a humongous dam. It's an Army Corps of Engineers lake. They inspect the dam every so often. They're looking for cracks. They're looking for weaknesses. And if the dam passes the test, they will say the dam has its integrity. So, I want to show up in a way to make sure I am acting and responding in a way that is true to who it is God has made me to be. Do I get it right all the time? No, but that's going back to T and T truth. But now that I've had that discussion, how do I act? How do I show up in a way that is true to how God has designed me to be? That's integrity.
okay? And um, so, yeah, what's my God design and integrity? So, <clears throat> hopefully, those things, uh, as, we, as I've unpacked them a little bit more from last week, give you some information on how to, what to do. So, it's the five A's of the self-care cycle. Think of it this way. How many have flown commercially, flown on a commercial flight? And you sit through that wonderful pre-flight check, and here's how you put your seatbelt on. And if the cabin loses pressure, what do you do? You put the mask on your little one first. Do you put the mask on your husband first? You put the mask on yourself first. If you speak to anybody who's in... Um, uh, airline industry, there is not enough time. You may tell yourself, I need to make sure my little one gets, but there is not enough time for you to attend to anybody else but yourself. For You will be of no use. So think of that very scientific laws of physics kind of analogy about the same way you treat yourself. So if I give myself the oxygen, if I love myself see myself the way Christ sees me, the way God sees me, I will operate from that position of, of feeling full of his grace, of his love, of his truth, and out of the fullness of that experience, I can now give. Give to Dusty, give to my kids, Pastor Gary, to you all, the community that I belong and if you do that for yourself, your experience, although you may tell yourself, no, 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 I got to give first, give first. I'm telling you, it's just not going to play out the way you think it is. That's all I have. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Thank you. It's really good. <clears throat> um, someone wrote this question. I think it's kind of relevant here because we, we're so used to trusting our feelings. Right. And, and they wrote, how can you address unhappy feelings that you constantly have? You feel discontent, discouraged, displeased with current relationships or situations. So there, it, it seems that this person is like a lot of us, that their feelings seem to outweigh their truth. Yeah. How so, do you deal with that? Yeah. So um, let me just go back to the world of parenting for a sec, because I think there's some truth that applies. <clears throat> you have to look at feelings like children. They are super important. They just yep. don't get to make all the decisions in your life. So if you have some very strong feelings, we've got some kids of our own. We've got four. They are very vocal now and because they're in their teenage years, almost all of them. But when they were younger, boy, they, they get to decide what we eat every once in a while. But you know what? I don't feel like mac and cheese every night. So <laughs> just like that, feelings are important. They're telling you something is going on. And if something is going on, go to the care cycle. Awareness, acceptance, allow, attend, and act. Awareness, acceptance, allow, attend, and act. So, yeah. Yeah. It seems like we're kind of addicted to trusting our feelings these days. Yeah. And they're yeah. tricky things. Yes. Yeah. You know, we may feel stuff, but it's not always based in reality. Right. But we also miss the boat if we just dismiss our feelings altogether. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's this pendulum swing, and I'm advocating for that pendulum to come down into the middle a little bit more. Yeah. Just pay attention, but don't be dictated by them. Now, I thought this was a great question, too. Uh, the person says, um, I once heard that only through conflict can you experience a greater level of intimacy. And then ask for thoughts on yeah. that. Yeah. I have that plenty on great. that one, but that's, that's, a, great. that's a big deal. Yeah, great question. Just give me a moment. You're pushing my buttons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me hear that you can, question you one more time. You can have your bear right yeah, I back. Can, no. He's been holding uh, it this whole time. That's awesome. <laughs> Uh, it's talking about uh, that they'd heard that through conflict, you can experience a greater level of intimacy. Yeah. Well, you know, when you think about what happens in conflict, um, it's harder to keep the mask up. Yeah, Right. exactly. So we start to rage. We start to vent. We start to um, 
criticize, cross complain, we do all these things, we're reacting. But the, the goal is to not judge the reactions, but to go, so it's not about the nail, right, from that video. If we just keep focusing on the nail, we'll miss the opportunity to form an understanding. And that's the goal of conflict resolution. Oh, so, for the longest time in our marriage, I mean, I love being with Dusty, but sometimes on a Saturday morning, um, she has some errands to run. Usually it's grocery shopping. So she's got her Saturday planned, and I, I don't share that all the time. I'd like to mow the lawn or wash the car or just sit down and watch TV. So we were in a good place, and I said, um, can I ask you a question about Saturdays and errands? Because there are some times I feel like I show up for you, and it's good, and other times I give you my yes, but you can read right through that, and you know that I'm just doing it because you want me to or I'm doing it because, you know, you just want to avoid a conflict or whatever it is. But, you know, we're in a good moment here. Can I just find out what that's about for you? So she works from home. <clears throat> I do a lot of traveling to Branson. I work here, a lot of late nights, and it's just the season of life that we're in. <clears throat> so she said, you know, that when you, when you decide to come with me on an errand or a grocery run, it's time with you. And I said, but we do spend time together, you know? I said, yeah, it's, it's not just time with you. It's like, I know you love me. And I said, but I tell you I love you all the time. So is there more to it? I'm like, what's below the surface? Um, and she said, you know what? When you're with me, I feel cared for. And I said, oh. So it's not about the nail. It's not about the grocery store. It's about spending time with you because you feel cared for when I do that. I can get behind that. Mm -hmm. I can give up a volleyball right. game. I, I mean, a football game. I can give up. Um, <laughs> my daughter was playing volleyball, so that just came to mind. I can give up my football game. I can give up mowing the lawn and do that. And so when I spend time on the front end, kind of being a little proactive before the conflict is in my face, it gives me a better chance of understanding my wife's heart. And at some point, you know, she and I can go back to that conversation and I could tell her my feelings on Saturday mornings to give her a chance to experience my thoughts, feelings, and behaviors on mm -hmm. Saturday. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, when we, when we look at conflict as an opportunity to build understanding, the relationship goes to a new level. Right. Absolutely. Well, I think it's another part of that, too, is that the, the mask comes off yeah. in conflict. Yeah. And if we survive that conflict, or if it becomes a, a positive experience in some way, uh, it, it tells, tells me you love me anyway. Right. And, and that gets, gets me out of that place of feeling unworthy and uh, I don't react to feeling unworthy or you making me feel unworthy. There's an opportunity in conflict literally to assure that person and to, to build a bridge. Yeah. And, and, and you've been somewhere before. Yeah. I, I mean, I found that to be true so many times. You go through something uh, with an associate in business or familiarly or whatever it might be, and you get through that thing. It's kind of like a bond. Yeah. And as neither one of you are willing to jump ship. Absolutely. As long as we have this understanding in conflict that, listen, even if I bring my best, they may not still feel cared yeah. for. Yeah. Here's something to think about, too. You know, how perfect was Jesus? I mean, it was pretty perfect. Mm -hmm. How high was Jesus' approval rating? Was it 100%? <laughs> Absolutely not. Did people accept him? Yes, but people rejected him, too. I can't expect more of myself than Jesus himself. So... Um, I can bring my best, but my best doesn't really matter if that person is unwilling to own their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, if Jesus couldn't convince everybody, I, I just need to keep that in mind. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to show up the way God designed me to as best as I can, but at the end of the day, they have to make that decision. So, yeah. But the opportunity is you give yourself a better chance 
if you talk below the reactions and talk about the feeling, talk about the hurt, uh, talk about the desire, the longing, the hopes, then if you spend time on the surface. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's four useless questions. <laughs> Can you um, Those are good. Put, that, put that slide up, Brandon? Four uh, useless questions. Who is right? Who's wrong? As a parent, you can waste so much time there. Yeah. When you're in relationship with somebody, you can waste a ton of time. Who is right? Who's wrong? Who's to blame? What really happened? Here's the problem with what really happened. That, that guy who drove by me on 60, he's going to have his perspective on what I was doing. I have my perspective on what I was doing. Do you think it'll meet? Probably not. You could be married to somebody. They're going to have their perspective on a situation. I'm going to have my perspective on a situation. In any kind of relationship, if Pastor Gary and I took, uh, after church, took a trip to Panera or something like this, and we rode in the same car, um, he will have his experience on this journey as the driver. I'll have my experience as the passenger. We'll have a shared experience together. They're not the same. Mm -hmm. So that's important to remember. Um, what really happened, it, it doesn't really matter <laughs> to some level. Now, of course, there are some situations that require. But here's the thing. So when talking about marriages, um, there's a group of people, and, and we need them. They are important, but lawyers make their money on what really happened. You know? That's, they make their living on that. And we may have some lawyers here, and, I'm, and I respect that profession, but I'm just telling you, if you get locked horns with your spouse, with your friend, uh, even with your pastor or, or somebody else in your life on what really happened, who's to blame, and you can't work that out because you're spending too much time there, that's when you need a lawyer to come in, third party, spend a lot of money, probably still won't be happy at the end of it. Right? Right. So what are we going to do about it? In a conflict and in that discussion I had about Sunday morning or Saturday mornings with Dusty and I, it's not like we ended that conversation and I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. It was just an opportunity to understand her point of view, not to adopt it for me or get her to see my point of view, but just to appreciate her for who she is. So in a conflict, you have this opportunity to appreciate that person for who they are, not to change them, not to coerce them, manipulate them. Um, so just kind of remove yourself from these questions. These are four useless questions in a relationship dynamic, okay? You know, I would, I would like to submit this in, in the final moments here. Um, I think sometimes uh, when the Lord tells us that iron sharpens iron, it's a principle in the kingdom, and we're going to have people in our lives that, that are going to be like a lady that was in our church in Phoenix uh, with me. I was young and... and uh, how many of you, when you were younger, had all the answers? Did, did anybody have all the answers? No, you didn't. I had them. <laughs> and this lady, I, I tell you, she, she found every opportunity to inform me of how I was wrong about things. And I, and I nicknamed her Sister Sandpaper because she just <laughs> rubbed me the wrong way all the time. But somewhere along the way... I fell in love with that lady. She was like 60 or something, uh, and I was in my, in my early 30s. And, but you know what? That lady was right about a lot of stuff. She was right about a whole bunch of stuff. I probably reminded her of her son or something, and, and, and she had seen this pattern before, and she knew where it was going. And I saw her as a resource after that. And I'm just telling you that God may have strategically placed someone in your life 
to knock the rough edges off of you at exactly the spot that the Spirit of God is working on. And it's what you won't listen to in your spirit, you may listen to with some grating voice. (laughs) And you won't like it. But it may be from the Lord. And if you can realize that this is this may be a good thing, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to hear from God. But it, it may be a good thing, and 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 but you know when you go through that stuff, I don't know. Uh, her name is Maxine, and Maxine's gone to be with the Lord now. But I, I tell you what, when I get to heaven, I'm gonna thank Maxine for being Maxine, and uh, she was a blessing to me. And uh, there's just some so many things that that I think we fight against that may be a divine appointment. If we'd just do what you said yeah. and, and, and back away from, from the trigger uh, that sends me over the cliff. Yeah. So to a degree, if you go back to the slide about fears, reactions, fears, reactions, to a degree, it's called the work of sanctification for a reason. Because we may come to the Lord and feel that regeneration power, but he's not done with us. And he won't be done with me until I see him face to face, right? right? Right. So that is the process of sanctification. We give ourselves the best chance to, with the help of God, to eliminate our reactions and with his help to reduce our fears. We'll never get rid of all those fears because we're a work in progress and he's faithful and just and he's going to be with us to the end. But we're never going to wipe them all away. But what we can do is when that button of of not good enough or controlled or disrespected gets hit, man, if if God has worked on our wound, as God has worked on our heart, that button may have been this big, but over the course of time, Mm -hmm. and he brings healing, that button just becomes a little smaller and smaller and smaller. So it may be tapped, and my body may say, ooh, not good enough. I remember that. But you know what? I'm full. My relationship with Christ is great. I can see Sister Maxine. Yeah. I can see her as a resource now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and when you go through those things and, uh, and you succeed, that builds up your self-esteem too because you realize, yeah. you know, well, God's doing something in me. Yeah. That would have got to me big time a few years ago. That would have, would have wrecked me. That would have made me so mad. But now I got a different perspective. Yeah. And life is a lot about perspectives. And I have a perspective right now I have to share with you because the nursery workers, I'm pushing their buttons because we're over time. Literally. And I'm feeling very inadequate right now. So stand, please. <laughs>